नमस्ते नमस्ते ओम गणानान्वा गणपति गुम हवा महे कवि कविन्नापमश्रवस्तम ज्येष्ठराज ब्रह्मण ब्रह्मणस्पत शृण्णनोतिशीदल नम हर्षिभ्य पूर्वजेभ्य पूर्वेभ्य पथिद्रुभ्य नम ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रॉम श्री ओरोविंदो सोसाइटी पांडिचेरी आज ए मार्क ऑफ सेलिब्रेटिंग द हंड्रेड फिफ्टी एथ बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ श्री ओरोविंदो एंड सेवेंटी फिफ्थ इयर्स ऑफ इंडिया इंडिपेन्डेंस और भारती श्री ओरोविंदो सोसाइटी प्रेजेंट्स एन इनाग्रल लेक्चर on the topic the secret of veda under the indian knowledge series by dr r b jahagirdar bhaiya oro bharati the vertical of shri aurobindo society strives to rediscover the spirit of indian cultural tradition and to, and to create a love and passion for mother india including its culture heritage religion philosophy and sciences we are working on the propagation of sanskrit as a language of consciousness and the ancient scriptures as a tracer trope of the knowledge which are mentioned by our ancient sages and the seers under the series we have started our first initiative on the vedas as the tradition says vedas are considered the fountain head of knowledge and the grand repository of a remarkable and divine tradition when we talk about the secret of the vedas sri aurobindo has also written i'm just quote there is always the true and still hidden secret of the veda the secret words ninya bajansi which are spoken for the purified in soul and the awakened in knowledge to disengage this less obvious but more important sense by fixing the import of vedic terms the sense of vedic symbols and the psychological function of the gods is thus a difficult but necessary task today we have an eminent speaker with us dr r b jahagirdar to speak on the occasion he is the managing trustee of sri aurobindo kapali shastri institute of vedic culture and trustee of sri aurobindo complex trust bangalore After obtaining his become uh, degree, he devoted himself to the service of Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh. The Einstein International University, Florida, USA, has conferred on him the degree of Doctor of Philosophy for his profound thesis, "The Relevance of the Vedas to the Modern Times," and Professor of Oriental Studies. He is also the editor of the News Bulletin of Sakshi and editor and director of Sakshi Project. for translating and publishing all the four vedas in kannada and various indian languages krishna yajurved taitiriya samhita first kanda and first mandala of rigved and many other books on the vedas are his translations completed and published under the guidance of dr r l kashyap which have been all hearted welcome by all the vedas lovers Dr Jahagirdar has greatly contributed to the upbringing of bringing of many budding writers and translators to the institution he worked with his love for books is further exhibited in his involvement and effort as the chief project officer of the project a library for each school launched by infosys foundation to supply books to 10000 schools so we are very much grateful for having dr r v jahagirdar today among us and really there is some secret of the vedas and we are eagerly waiting to listen from him and i am heartily welcome dr r v jahagirdar bhaiya to kindly start uh, the lecture now the floor is yours namaste thank you kishor ji ओम ओम 
ಪರ್ಜನ್ಯಂತು ನದಯೋ ವರ್ಷಂತು ಪರ್ಜನ್ಯಾಪಿಪ್ಪಲಾವೋಷಧಯೋ ಅನ್ನವತಾನ್ ಓದನವತಾನ್ ಮಾವಿಕ್ಷುವತಾನ್ ಮಾಭ್ರಾತಾಭ್ರಾತರನ್ ದಿಕ್ಷನ್ ಮಾ ಸ್ವಸಾರ ಮುದ ಸ್ವಸಂಚ ಸೌರುತ ಭೂತ್ವ ವಾಚಂ ವದತ ಭದ್ರತ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಆನಂದಮಯಿ ಚೈತನ್ಯಮಯಿ ಸತ್ಯಮಯಿ ಪರಮೇ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ಶ್ರೀಯರವಿಂದಯ ನಮಃ my salutations to the lotus feet of the mother and shri arabindo and my pranams to all of you who are participating in this inaugural session of the lecture series on the veda organized by aro bharati of course i have taken this mission of spreading the message of the veda as envisaged by shri arobindo most of us know that the contribution of shri arobindo is unparalleled in the field of vedas Shri Aurobindo's contribution to the Vedas is mainly in unearthing the symbolism of Vedas. So centuries together people were following the Vedas or they were restricting the Vedas to the extent that they are useful only for chanting in some occasions or the religious occasions like upanayana marriage and some yagas yagnas and so and so forth but very clearly shri arabindo has given us the message that vedas are meant for application vedas are meant for following vedas are relevant or more relevant to our day to day life that is the significant contribution of sharabindo so as we know two of his books on veda are in fact three but two major the secret of the veda and the hymns to the mystic fire before i share my analysis or my perception of shri arbindo's thoughts on veda i would like to take you to the world of vedas in the words of shri arbindo himself the vedas are the roots of indian civilization and the supreme authority in indian religion for 3000 years by the calculation of european scholars for a great deal more in all probability the faith of this nation certainly one of the most profound acute and intellectual in the world has not left its hold on this cardinal point of belief its greatest and most rationalistic minds have never swerved from the national faith kapila held to it no less than shankara the two great revolted intellects buddha and brahaspati 
could not dethrone the Veda or destroy India's spiritual allegiance. India, by an inevitable law of her being, casts out sooner or later everything that is not Vedic. The Dhammapada has become a scripture for foreign peoples. Brahaspati's strictures are only remembered as a curiosity of our intellectual history. Religious movements and revolutions have come and gone or left their mark, but after all and through all the Veda remains to us, our rock of ages, our eternal foundation. Next, again, in the words of Sri Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo shares his experience or his interaction with the Vedas here in a few lines. My first contact with Vedic thought came indirectly while pursuing certain lines of self-development in the way of yoga, which, without my knowing it, were spontaneously converging towards the ancient and now unfrequented paths followed by our forefathers. At this time, there began to arise in my mind an arrangement of symbolic names attached to certain psychological experiences which had begun to regularize themselves. And among them, there came the figures of three female energies, Ila, Saraswati, Sarama, representing severely three out of the four faculties of the intuitive reason, revelation, inspiration, and intuition. Two of these names were not well known to me as names of Vedic goddesses, but were connected rather with the current Hindu religion or with old Puranic legend, Saraswati, goddess of learning, and Ila, mother of lunar dynasty. But Sarama was familiar enough. I was unable, however, to establish any connection between the figure that rose in my mind and the Vedic hound of heaven, who was associated in memory with the Argive Helen and represented only an image of the physical dawn entering in its pursuit of the vanished herds of light into the cave of the powers of darkness. When once the clue is found, the clue of the physical light imaging the subjective, it is easy to see that the hound of heaven may be the intuition entering into the dark caverns of the subconscious mind to prepare the delivery and outflashing of the bright illuminations of knowledge which have there been imprisoned. But the clue was wanting and I was obliged to suppose an identity of name without any identity of the symbol. I think it is much clear how Sri Aurobindo pursued the studies and his meditations upon the Vedas. Further he says, the gods I found to be described as children of light, sons of Aditi, of infinity, and without exception, they are described as increasing man, bringing him light, pouring on him the fullness of the waters, the abundance of heavens, increasing the truth in him, building up the divine words, leading him against all attacks to the great goal, the integral felicity, the perfect bliss, their separate functions emerged by means of their activities, their epithets, the psychological sense of the legends connected with them. This is the brief background how Sri Aurobindo built the magnificent building of Veda or the foundations of the, the core of the Veda. Now, 
let us see the teachings of Aurobindo, the teachings of Sri Aurobindo, on the basis of the Veda. I started my study of the secret of the Veda when I was about 18 years. The mother and Sri Aurobindo's grace, I continued it, and so forth, so forth. I have come here. Let me share share with you what I have understood and what I am following and what I am planning to follow in the path of Sri Aurobindo in the light of the Veda. Here, I am presenting some of the key ideas and the ideals contained in the earliest books of Hindus, namely Rugveda, Ajurveda, Samaveda and Atharva Veda. The meters in these verses have names as Gayatri, Anushtup, etc. The four books have substantial mantras totaling about 26,000 and there are three types of mantras. One is Ruk, other is Ejus, the third one is Saman. Ruks are, or you call it as Riks or Ruks, Ruk mantras are metrical verses. Yajus mantras do not have the meters, they are by and large they are prose mantras. And the salmon, there are two types of salmon, salmon meant for singing and salmon meant for chanting. You must have listened it, the salmon, they apply the musical notes to while chanting the mantra and the uh, sama mantras are two types of sama mantras. Yoni and Gana. Yoni mantras are the source mantras. By and large, all the 1800 mantras of the Sama Veda are collections from the Rugveda and they are chanted in a specific manner they, that is called as Sama Gana. Here, while continuing our journey of understanding the secret of the Veda, we have to understand certain things that is first and foremost veda teaches us the all sided perfection or the integral perfection let us see how it is many of the mantras of the veda deal with the concept of all sided perfection of human life and its realization. So I frequently I give my stress on this because application of Veda is more important and it is the it is the call of Sri Aurobindo that all of us should apply the teachings of the Veda. Persons who have curiously glanced at the summary translation of the mantras of Rigveda due to Griffith or whom this statement applies. The wisdom in the Rig Veda will be apparent to only persons who can understand the extensive symbolism in the verses. This about the symbolism uh, I will deal in detail in my continued time. The ideal of all sided perfection and its achievement by a person has been mentioned in several so-called New Age books or the personality development books. Achieving perfection in particular activity, which is mostly under one's control, is straightforward. If someone is serious about learning music, then they may approach the best music teacher in the neighborhood for learning the music. Even such a case, the interest in pursuing the particular activity such as music goes down with the time for many people. Further, harmonizing many different activities is a 
major issue for many people. The idea of achieving perfection in an activity involving several people is also formidable. We have heard slogans like quality time, budgeting time, etc. In response to such problems, many of us accept that the solution is often about assigning priorities, which is basically a form of compromise. The idea of achieving harmony and beauty in one's own activities and those involving others is rarely mentioned in this scenario. A closely related idea is to spiritualize our everyday life. To spiritualize our everyday life. That is recognizing the existence of the Supreme Spirit. Recognizing the existence of the Supreme Spirit which pervades and energizes every aspect of existence and invoking this Supreme Spirit in every activity. So this detail, how to invoke these gods or the cosmic energies is dealt in detail in Sri book, The Secret of the Veda. He has dealt it, he has taken several gods, translated those mantras and written extensive notes and all these translation and notes as I understand is mostly how to invoke the gods and make them our collaborator in the journey towards the divine. In the Indian tradition, the meaning of the word spiritual is quite different from religion as commonly understood. Spirituality is free of any dogma or creed. Spiritual experience is an experience of the spirit or spiritual consciousness or the consciousness which pervades the entire cosmos including all human activities. For instance, from the point of view of our ordinary consciousness, each human being is different from every other being, human or non-human. But from the point of view of spiritual consciousness, each one of us is a point in the ocean of consciousness. The thoughts, the desires, the emotions, etc. of each being appear to be waves in the ocean of the spirit. Each wave waxing and waning through each point of the cosmos, each point corresponding to each being. The movement of a particular wave of desire through a particular point gives the impression that the associated person has that particular wave of desire which she or he thinks originated in her or him. Further, the power of a person depends on the cosmic forces of which he has conscious or unconscious control. Consequently, there is hard barrier between individual human beings and the cosmic powers called as devas, including the Supreme One. So just to break this barrier and unite with them is the Veda knowledge. Once we understand the unity of the universe, we can more easily answer the question, how to imbibe beauty and harmony in every aspect of our life. 
that is harmony and beauty in the thoughts and feelings harmony and beauty in every outward action and movement harmony and beauty in the surroundings some proponents of different religions believe that the faith itself will show the way which is called as shraddhahi paramo dharma in both the approaches we recognize that everyone works throughout every waking moment in some way or the other the work may be cooking reading music athletic etc however do we understand what work is some people claim that they do work for getting enjoyment what is the source of enjoyment so veda clearly give the picture of what is the work how the work has to be carried out what is the enjoyment and what is the connection between work enjoyment and the progress it appears that rugveda samhita on which shri arabindo has concentrated more has answers to all the above questions relating to life as a unique journey the nature of the work the forces behind any activity relationship between work and enjoyment and work kind of the progress so i have pointed out this into five headings all the five that i told life as a unique journey the nature of work the forces behind any activity relationship between work and enjoyment and the work kind progress so now let us see one after another life as a unique journey so in veda this journey is called as adhvara means progress journey means we progress we proceed we move from a a place a lower place to the higher place so the call of the veda or the message of the veda or the core of the, one of the core ideas of the vedas is life is a journey so that is why we now and then we hear that shloka charai veti charai veti move forward move forward everyone should always concentrate on the idea of moving forward that is the development or the progress according to the sages of the veda everyone should regard his or her life as a journey from one peak of perfection to another peak see the clarity of the rishis one peak of perfection to another they have indicated that help is always available for those who embark on such exciting journeys we shall quote here one mantra that is rugveda 1.10.2 that means first mandala 10th sukta and the second mantra so for the ease of understanding we have divided this mantra into four parts the mantra is that is 10.2.1 mantra is yatsanoho sanum arhat bhuri aspashta kartvam tat indro artham chetati yuthena vrishtir ejati and the shyarbindo's translation is when the worshipper climbs from peak to peak when the worshipper climbs from peak to peak he realizes the progress that is yet to be achieved then the cosmic power indra awakens in the seeker 
the purpose of the journey and manifests with his troop to aid the devotee or the aspirant in his journey. And this is the first mandala, 10th sukta and the second mantra. This mantra is straightforward in its meaning and there is no symbolism here. The phrase climbing from peak to peak indicates the life journey of an individual attaining one level of perfection to another level of perfection. Here the second line that is Bhuri Aspashta Kartvam is deep psychological insight that only a person who starts on a journey can understand what is yet to be earned. Let us make it more clear. The sages throughout the Veda tell that gods are always eager to approach the human being. Gods are always eager to approach the human being, but the first step has to be taken from the human being. If I keep my one step forward, gods will rush towards in 10 steps. So this explanation is hidden in this line of this mantra. The third phrase or the third line or the third pada of this mantra is, it makes an important statement that the person making the journey is not alone or helpless. There is always divine help who seek for that. <clears throat> the cosmic force or the God by the name Indra himself awakens in him the purpose of his journey and indicates within him or her the next peak to be pursued. This is more important. The God Indra literally comes in a subtle manner and extends the help to the human being or for the better understanding we can call as aspirant. This verse is not unique in Rig Veda. There are many others which deals with the life journey and the ascent. Some persons may have read statements made by so-called competent translators that Rig Veda is ritualistic and it is devoid of reference to higher mental operations. We have found that Rig Veda has at least 36 words in dealing with mental or over mental operations. This list is available in the book by A.B. Purani, the studies in the Veda. It is really not so good to regard all these words as synonyms. All the 36 words denoting the ascent are not synonyms. For instance, the two words vichetas and prachetas both denote the both can be translated as the ascent. Vichetas and prachetas means respectively that is vichetas means one wide in the consciousness, one wide with the consciousness and the prachetas means one who has the perceptive knowledge, one who has the perceptive knowledge. Hence, all these 36 words are non-synonyms. They stand unique for a particular psychological aspect of a human being. Secondly, one may wonder whether the climbing refers only to the meditative activities or to the activities of everyday life involving the life energy that is prana and the mind. It should be borne in mind that the Vedas does not indulge in a rigid separation of the realm of activities into worldly and spiritual. There is no hard barrier. There is no watertight compartment. 
its aim is that all activities including these of daily transaction must be spiritualized or made spiritual in support i would like to quote this verse mantra 5.7.5 अवस्प येषने स्वेद पथिषु जीवति दट इज हेन इन हिज सर्विस मेन कास्ट डाउन दे आर स्वेट ऑन द पाथ्स दे असेंड टू ए सेल्फ बॉर्न और सेल्फ जॉयस ग्राउंड एज इफ टू वाइड लेवस भूमा पृष्ठे वूरुहु सो इन अदर वर्ड्स the ascent to the peaks is possible by the physical and mental activities that is casting sweat the rishis always respect the work the rishis teach us to work the rishis teach us to involve into the physical activities as well as the mental activities so there is there should not be a hard barrier between physical and mental both of them are supportive and a collaborative activity of mental and physical works leads us to the divinity so before proceeding further we have to focus on the nature of the cosmic forces called as gods so this god is a not a good translation but the actual word for the cosmic forces used in the veda is devas the word devas is derived from the root div div means the light illumination the gods such as agni indra ganapati saraswati ila bharati aditi etc so now it is time to see who are the gods we frequently say that we have to collaborate with the cosmic forces or the devas who are these gods god, devas according to shri arbindo veda declares the existence of the supreme person that is parama purusha we must know that uh, uh, mandala 10 the 90th sukta is purusha sukta that clearly defines who is the supreme person or the parama purusha the parama purusha or the deva who is both transcendent also permeates all the aspects of the manifestation the supreme spirit is described in atharva veda 10th kanda 8th sukta and 27th mantra which is also appearing in the shweta shatara upanishad 3rd chapter and the 6th mantra tom stream tom pumanasi tom kumara utava kumari tom jirno dandena vanchasi tom जातो भवसी तम जातो भवसी विश्व तो मुख दट इज यू आर दि वुमन यू आर दि मैन यू आर दि ब्यूटिफुल मेडन यू आर दि बॉय यू आर दि वन टॉटरिंग ऑन दि स्टाफ यू विथ हंड्रेड फेसिस look everywhere so that clearly says supports our statement that the parama purusha is transcendent and at the same time he permeates in everything that is manifested on the earth there is nothing else in this universe except this capital o one but veda does not deny the existence of many that is called with the words 
Diti and the Aditi. Diti is many, Aditi is one. The core of this one is simply called as Tat. Tat. Capital one is called in the Veda as Tat. That one. The gods or the devas are not personifications of qualities or powers. They are emanations or the conscious forces which may be called the limbs of the supreme one. The limbs of the supreme one. They have names. I just now told you they have several names as Agni, Indra, Saraswati, Ila, Bharati, Ganapati, like this. They are supra-physical beings without physical bodies, but are endowed with consciousness, knowledge and power. Consciousness, knowledge and power. They can carry out their actions directly from their consciousness. They need not appear in front of us with the two hands, two legs and so forth and so on. By following certain practices, a human being can come into conscious contact with one or more of these cosmic forces. So this is a more important statement. Only the, only the Maharshis like Sri Aurobindo can tell such words, tell, gives their statement because of their realizations. That is, by following certain practices, a human being can come into conscious contact with one or more of these cosmic forces. All these forces are harmonious and their aim is to help human beings in their journey towards the all-sided perfection. When a human being prays for the help of cosmic power, that power, you see, this is the process, how exactly collaboration between the human being and the devas is established. When a human being prays for the help of a cosmic power, that power responds and puts an emanation within the human being. <clears throat> This action is described metaphorically as the birth of the particular deva as a child in the human being. This could grow indicating that the power of the particular god grows and helps the human being in his onward journey. Each god such as Agni or Indra has a unique psychological power and a personality which helps the human being develop that power. For example, Sri Aurobindo has symbolized the Agni Deva as the God of the will or the Lord of the will and Indra is the Lord of the mind that is Lord of the clarity in the mind or clear thinking. So he, Indra addresses the psychological power of thinking and Agni addresses the power of will in the human being. There are about 2000 mantras addressed to Agni and about 2500 mantras addressed to Indra in the Rugveda. The very first hymn in Rugveda describes the power of Agni. We all know that uh, mantra, Agni Mele Purohitam. He is not merely physical fire or the deity of the fire, whatever it may mean. Agni is declared as the power of will in man who initiates all actions. So, Agni is the power of will who initiates in the human being every action. So every action is initiated by the power of the will. That means they are all 
initiated by the Agni Deva. Agni's preeminence in Veda arises from the fact that he lays the foundation for the development of the spiritual life. He lays the foundation, which obviously takes a long time effort. So we have seen the process of a small seed, seed, seed growing into a big tree. So there are several stages in between the small seed sown into the land and a big tree that is manifested. The same, in the same manner, Agni initiates or he sows the seed of will in human being. And through our efforts, through our sadhana, we should make it to grow, we should make it to blossom, we should make it to carry the life into it and grow. This is how the journey is undertaken. Agni is born first in woman and then helps her or him in the manifestation of other gods in him. That is why Agni is called as the messenger. Agni is called as messenger or the Purohita. Purohita means the one who invokes the gods. First, we have to invoke Agni just because once he is established in the human being, then it is his responsibility. It is the responsibility of the Agni to invoke other gods according to the needs of the person who is undertaking the onward journey. We should clearly bear this in our mind. How there in our workshops and the lectures and so many people ask the question, how do I begin? Where does the spiritual journey starts? See, this is very clear through this Vedic interpretation Sri Aurobindo has given that first we should invoke Agni. That is, we should awaken our willpower or in other words, aspiration, abhipsa. We should awaken this abhipsa and the abhipsa or the aspiration or the Agni Deva with his consciousness, with his actions, he will invoke all other gods who addresses various psychological faculties in the human being. Now it is, I think, better to look how the Indra work or the work of the Indra. Indra is the lord of the divine mind and the actions. Previously, uh, I told you that both the activities have to be collaborated, physical and mental works to be collaborated and they should go hand in hand. The role of Indra is to help human beings develop the abilities for mental formation and associated action. First, the mental formation has to be, has to be taken place and the action follows the mental formations. That's the system, how the human, human being works. First, the mental formations are created and the action follows the plan. Indra is primarily the deity who gives the appropriate knowledge to human beings so that they can perform all their action to the highest possible level of perfection. <clears throat> Actions are not limited to these on the physical plane. That is, those we do with our hands, legs, mouth, etc. They include the actions done at an inner level also, the inner vital, inner physical, etc. We recognize that everyone works throughout every waking moment, in some way or the other. The work may be cooking, reading, listening to the music, or playing music, or pure manual work, etc. But what is work itself? What is work itself? One can define it 
as what is done by using the organs of action like hands, legs, mouth, etc. So normally this is explained or defined in the books of modern management. But this doesn't it appear very vague to us? For me, it appears very vague. Veda has original insights connecting to this aspect. That is the nature of work and how it is done. It states that every work begins with some entities, physical, mental, etc. Work is the transformation of one set of entities with unique structures. One set of entities with unique structure and functions to another set of entities with different structures and functions which are presumably more useful to the person doing the work. Again, this is an act of collaboration. For, for example, or for instance, let us take the activity of cooking. Here, the entities are the raw materials such as water, rice, vegetables, spices, utensils, etc. And the source of energy is the heat. The human cook mixes the ingredients and heats them following a recipe resulting in the cooked food. Usually, the human cook takes complete credit for the final result of the cooked food. A little reflection will reveal the inappropriateness of the claim by the human being. The ingredients like rice, water, vegetables, etc. have inherent properties to combine with another under the appropriate conditions of heat to result in the properties of taste and nourishment contained in those ingredients. The source of the energy and its instruments are not the human cook's creation. The utensils needed for the cooking have gone through a complex process for their functioning. The contribution of the human cook is to mix, stir and heat in the appropriate manner. The Vedic says, perceived that the main contributors in the edible food are the cosmic forces indicated by the riceness of rice, wateriness of water, heat power of fire and others. The rice itself is the end product of a complex process whose major contributors are the cosmic forces. In the growing process of a rice seed yielding another rice seed, it involves several steps. In other words, the major contributors in any work, any work, the so-called willed work carried out by human beings are the cosmic forces known by the names Agni, Indra, etc. And the human contribution is really minuscule even though it is vital. It cannot be washed away, it cannot be kept up. Human has to, as I said, human has to take the first step and rest of the things are contributed by the Devas to fulfill the human being to fill him with the divinity. So, another aspect is work and enjoyment. Every action done consciously as an offering to the God mind Indra automatically results in the release of delight or joy called as Soma. We come, we come across with the Soma 
in the Veda, in several mantras, especially the ninth mandala of Rugveda, all the mantras are addressed to the god Soma. The Westerners and the followers of these Westerners, the Indologists, have con considered or have translated the Soma as the intoxicating drink of the gods. But Sri Aurobindo has found that Soma, wherever the word Soma appears, it is the bliss of the human existence. Soma is the bliss of the existence. We have heard this um, Veda and Upanishad mantra, Madhuvata Rutaide, Madhuksharanti Sindhavaha. That means everywhere the bliss, the bliss is inside, the bliss is outside, and everywhere the bliss is there. For that purpose, for the human enjoyment, we have to invoke the Soma. How do we invoke this Soma? It is again made clear by the Vedic Rishis. Vedic Rishi says through the Veda mantras that we do so many works and while doing some work and gaining some achievement, that achievement or that performance or that work will carry some part or some share of ego or I have done it. So to take out this ego, to take out this, this part of I, what one has to do? We have to offer it to Agni, which is called as Yajna in the Yajna or the Yaga in the external Yajna. We offer it to the Agni and Agni being the Duta or Agni being the messenger, he will carry our offer to the respective gods. If we have offered it to Indra, if we have offered it to Saraswati, if we have offered it to Surya, he takes our offerings to the, those respective devas and deliver it to them. And in turn, accepting our offer, these gods or the devas, they will purify it. They will purify it and send back to us through this messenger Agni Deva and Agni Deva will bring them and establish in the human being or the person who has offered them. This is the subtle difference between the, the human and the divine. When we do some activity that will be human, when we offer it to the gods or the devas, they will purify it. The purified act or the purified activities of the human being is the divinity or the divine. This is how the enjoyment or the joy is defined in the Vedas. And this message of the Rishis is clearly brought to us by our master, Sri Aurobindo, through his great work, The Secret of the Veda. So now the question is, how does one begin this journey? I just gave a clue to you, taking the references from the Veda mantra themselves, we can just briefly see how this journey begins. We already know that Agni is the beginning. At the same time, Agni is the end. We know that the Rig Veda starts with Agni mantra, and it concludes, the 10th manda, mandala concludes with the Agni Mantra. Agni is the divine will. He is the will in the mind and he gives the necessary aspiration for the upward journey. He is also will in the prana, the dynamic life energy. Prana means dynamic life energy. He divorces. He devours, enjoys, and purifies the nervous being. The proverbial psychological force such as Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, 
Mada, Matsara. <coughs> he transforms all these things into the divine aspect. His Agni's first work is transform this shed repose or the shed vairis, Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Mada, Matsara, etc. Agni, here you can, I can uh, give you the reference of the 5.7.4 of Rugveda, that is four mantra, the Ketum Krunoti, Ketum Krunoti, that is Agni, the cosmic power who leads us on the journey, create the light of intuition in us. There is no ambiguity here. Rishis are very, very, very clear. So there is no ambiguity. Agni creates the light of intuition. So everything that we have to see from in the light of this intuition. He ignites this intuition. He ignites this light of intuition. And we can see the 5.7.7 mantra from the Rugveda. Agni tears down the desert of our dwelling. That is, breaks down all the wrong ideas about the world as an unhappy place or place without aim. There are innumerous people carry this idea that this life is misery. So there is no aim for this life. But Vedic Rishis have given a clear call. There is an aim. There is a purpose for this life. We have seen this uh, uh, this popular mantra. Badrang karne vip pranashunoyama devaha. What does that mean? In the same mantra, the third line is Thirai rangai tushtu agum sasta no bihi Veshema deva hitam yadayuhu. Thirai rangai tushtu agum sada. That means make my limbs more strong. Why? Am I going to participate in wrestling or boxing? No. Veshema deva hitam yadaihu. So that let me invest this life. Let me put this life in the service of the gods. Service of the gods means service of the divinity. I wish to serve the gods. So make my limbs more perfect. Thirai rangai tushtu agum sasta no bihi. Veshema Deva Hitam Sadayu. So always I want to serve the God. Always I want to serve the divinity. So this is this divine light, Agni ignites, Agni awakens this divine light. Here exactly our journey begins. And this is the starting point of the journey or the Advara according to the Vedas. And this is the secret which is called by Sri Aurobindo. Until we know some certain things or something, that remains a secret. So, by giving title itself, as I understand, Sri Aurobindo attracts us towards the secret of the Vedaha. As in the introduction part, uh, he told us, Ninya Vachamsi. So, the mantras or ninya, they are secret. Secret to the extent we become eligible to understand the meaning. We become, we rise to the level of understanding the mantras. So they are kept secret and Sri Aurobindo has cleared, said clearly that rishis have kept them, the, the rishis have hidden the secrecy intentionally so that they should not reach to the person who is not able to understand the symbolism or the deeper meaning or the rahasya artha of the Vedas. The main associates of Indra are the Maruts. They act on our animal consciousness made up of the impulses of nervous mentality and transforms them into brilliant rays of the sun. Now it is time to 
devote some time to the symbolism in Rigveda, on which Sri Aurobindo has uh, uh, devoted much of his time, much of his writings. Let us see in brief. If we read an English translation of the Rigveda, such as one by the Wilson Griffith, we see that by and large, it consists either of pedestrian sentences. This is, these are the words of Sri Pedestrian sentences such as, O Indra, drink the Soma and kill Vrutra. You drink the Soma and kill the Vrutra. Vrutra is the demon, devil or the negative forces which are always fighting against the forces of the light or enigmatic sentences such as the sages smashed the hill by their sound. So does this make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. So as the Vedas were brought down to the level of senselessness, Sri Aurobindo has to enter into this field and again bring out the secret of the Veda or the greatest message for the human being. So Sri Aurobindo meditated upon all these things and he brought out the symbolism or the rahasya hidden in the Veda and he showed us, he threw light on the real aspects or the real teachings of the Veda through unearthing the Vedic knowledge or the symbolism of the Veda. There are only a small number of verses which appear to be wisdomful. This is stated by the great Western interpreters. And they say that often there is no consistency between the several phrases within a single verse, let alone the entire hymn. It is claimed that the translation itself is faithful, but only the tradition of Hindus in assigning wisdom to the Rigveda and its poets is mistaken. This is the view of many an Indian academics for more than a century, of, more than a centuries. And what? How does the Veda make sense by understanding the symbolism? I say, in the light of Sri Aurobindo, that Rigveda is high class, high class poetry. It is sheer poetry, poverty of imagination to read poetry. See, uh, understanding the poetry written by the modern poets or poets of belonging to some 50, 60 years is really difficult to understand unless we have the background of literature or the symbolism and other things. So it is really difficult to <coughs> take the words as they are from the Vedas. Hence, we have to see each and every mantra or to that matter, each word in the Veda mantras have to be seen the hidden symbolism behind those words and sentences and the mantras. So as the time is running out, instead of um, uh, dealing in uh, great detail with the symbolism, let me tell you the symbolism given by Sri Aurobindo. So Sri Aurobindo has given symbolism in some two, three aspects. One is symbolism connected with some proper nouns or names. Agni we dealt with he is the Lord of willpower and he awakens or he arouses the willpower in the human being. Indra is the lord of mind and vayu is another deva in in the classical sanskrit if you go to the dictionary vayu means wind but when the word vayu is used in the mantra symbolically we have to understand that he is the lord of all the life energies prana which represent the passions, 
feelings, emotions and the abilities. Why you represent these qualities, these psychological aspects of passions, feelings, emotions and the abilities. And we come across with the Ashwins, the twin gods. What is the symbolism of Ashwins? The, they are, the Ashwins are the lords of bliss and divine physicians. They are the divine physicians who render the human body free of disease so that it can accept the divine prana or the life energy. Next comes Mitra. Normally Mitra and Varuna together come in mantras and almost all the mantras are addressed to Mitra and Varuna together. They always do the same work unanimously. So Mitra and Varuna represent the psychological aspect of love and harmony. Love and harmony. The master Varuna is the master of infinities who cannot tolerate restrictive thinking or actions. In one of the mantras, uh, some of you may recollect, in one of the mantras it is said that this Varuna is present everywhere. Whatever you do, whatever you talk, whatever you gossip, he hears. He hears them and he can take it to the person about whom you have talk, talked and be careful about talking of others behind their back. This is the intelligence. And Saraswati. In the Puranas, normally Saraswati is considered as the goddess of education or goddess of learning. But when you come to the Veda, she is the goddess of inspiration. In the one of the Saraswati mantras, it is told as Prachetayati Ketunam. Prachetayati Ketunam. She awakens the intellect. Ketu is the intellect. Ila is another goddess, the goddess of revelations. Revelation is not the one step or the revelation is not one stage. Revelations happens each and every stage stage and step of our life, we should be wide awake to experience, to understand and to involve in these revelations, which the, especially the sadhakas or the yogis should be always alert to understand the revelations that take place in our physical level, mental level and the vital level. And Sarama is another god, goddess. She is the goddess of intuition. Sarama is the goddess of intuition. And Surya, Surya, physical Surya we see, but when it comes to the Veda, when Rishis use in the mantras Surya, Surya, Savitru, all these, whenever they use the word Surya in the mantra, Sri Aurobindo says that we should understand that they are referring the supreme deity of light and force, supreme deity of life and force. And when it comes to the symbolism of the, some of the common nouns, common nouns, uh, the words connected to the common nouns, they should be also understood in the light of symbolism. Example, go or go. Go means in the classical Sanskrit, go means cow. If we understand go as cow in the Vedic mantra, the mantras become senseless. Or you will laugh at the meaning of those meanings. But Sri Aurobindo took all those mantras wherein the go, the word go appears, maybe more than 1000 mantras, and he studied all of them. And he concluded that wherever the rishis have used the word go or the cow, that means they are referring or they are understanding or they are asking us to understand that go means the ray of light. 
in several of the mantras in the Rigveda, the rishis pray to the gods to, to give them 10 cows, 100 cows, 1000 cows or innumerous cows. Does it, is it not apt to ask the question Rishi, whether rishis were running any uh, dairy farm? Why should they ask for the innumerous cows, 100 cows, 1000 cows? A rishi running a way the patashala, one or ten or twenty or hundred cows are enough. Why should he ask innumerous cows? This is the question Sri Aurobindo asked, and he came out with the meaning that wherever the word go or the go is used, that means it is the ray of knowledge. And rishis have asked, prayed for the abundant rays of knowledge for their tapas. And there are such word is. Ashwa. Ashwa also appears in several mantras. Ashwa means in the classical, uh, in the classical Sanskrit, Ashwa means horse. But again, Sri Aurobindo referred the word ha, Ashwa in various mantras and he found in his deepest meditation that Ashwa, wherever the rishis have used the word Ashwa, that word denotes the Prana Shakti in the human being. Again, in this context, Rishis were asking for 10 Ashwas, 100 Ashwas, 1000 Ashwas, innumerous Ashwas. They have prayed for to the God to give them innumerous horses. What a Rishi will do with the innumerous horses? He was not having any military or he do not had his own army. But he was in need of enormous, enormous power to undertake or to continue the tapas. So wherever the word Ashwa comes, that means Rishis are referring to the Prana Shakti in the human being. And other words are there, Adri, Apaha, Nadi. Adri means, Adri means big hill. Yeah, we saw a mantra. What does the, what does the Westerners translate it? Rishis have written the mantra. They say that the one of the meaning of the mantras, one of the meaning of the mantras of, is that taking the cows, they shattered the hill. Does it make any sense? See the Sri Aurobindo's translation of this particular mantra that the human being shattered. Adri means ignorance. The human beings shattered the ignorance with the ray of the light. See this translation, how deep meaning it is, how satisfactory meaning it gives. This is the contribution of Sri and this is the secret. How to understand the Veda is the secret of the Veda. And there is Nadi. Normally Nadi is the river. In the classical Sanskrit means Nadi is the river. But Sri Aurobindo perceived it. Sri Aurobindo meditated upon this word river and he came to. That is the flowing current of energies. Why should a man pray to the Nadi? It originates somewhere. It flows somewhere. And ultimately it joins the sea. Why so many mantras addressing the Nadi? If I do not pray to Nadi, does it stop flowing? Does it stop leaving water to us? Of course, in the physical level, in our external life, what is unavoidable, water is necessary. All right, why should Rishis praise to so much? Oh, Nadi, you awaken. What does this mean? How, do, how does a physical river awaken? Here, because Nadi is the represent as the symbol of the currents flowing inside the human being and Rishis, Rishis prayer for this currents or the flows of the energies may be continuously flowing without any hindrances. That is the prayer of the rishis. If we understand the Vedas with this background, using this symbolism, our study will be more perfect and easily and without any confusion, we can start applying the Veda knowledge to 
our day to day life this is the greatest contribution of sri arvindo of course uh, it is a big book most of you must have read that book the earlier part of the book is uh, taking out the doubts and confusions in the people about the veda and the later part of the secret of the veda book deals with making us to understand the symbolism of the veda so it is my earnest concern that all of us shall study the vedas or the veda mantras in the light of shri aurobindo and that would be the apt way of following our master uh, i think this is the time to conclude my speech uh, if i have taken more time uh, i am sorry and uh, i thank all of you for listening me with a great patience thank you all namaste is there any kishor ji yeah thank you so much for your uh, it's a valuable or very informative lecture so when the beginning uh, i quote sure windows when he says that there is always the true and still hidden secret of the veda in your lecture you have mentioned the great tradition of the vedas which flown from the seers to the modern sages as the tradition says that shakshat kruta rsha dharmana bhagavo so this is really one of the remarkable lectures which we listen from you and your lecture you have mentioned clearly mentioned how the vedic hymns reveals the true spirit of the knowledge and the secret of the veda means to understand that secret and and particularly you have given special emphasis on its application like the shastra says shastra and prayog as the tradition says that lakshana pramana abhyam hi vastu siddhi unless we apply those principles in our life we cannot understand this in a particular manner and listening to you i was just uh, remembering that we are listening from a rishi from the sages who is bearing the tradition to the modern generations like this and when we talk about the symbolic ideas which was revealed in the form of the ninya bachamsi the secret words i would like to put one of the uh, quotations of sri arvindo in the savitri where he says there is a book of beings index page the text and glossary of the vedic truth are there the rhythms and the meters of the stars significant of the movement of our feet the symbol powers of numbers and of form and the secret code of the history of the world and nature's correspondence with the soul are written in the mystic heart of life this is really one of the interesting lectures to listen from you and uh, we have we are glad that today more than 60 participants from different institutions they have participated here and our chairman sri pradeep narambhaya was also here i think you will join soon and one of the participants uh, from the dr andrew cj and madam navagatan mohanty ji and much more names are that i do not want to take all these due to positive time so now i think now the floor uh, is open for a little bit discussions and whatever they have uh, queries or suggestions this is the dr chanabaswanna aha uh-huh. sir i would uh, suggest that to have this uh, like satsang uh, every week so that uh, it will be very nice so, so that we can uh, in- include more people and uh, we can have more knowledge uh, sharing uh, sessions sir because it is very nice soothing to hear from sir uh, same uh, knowledge uh, last workshop also the same knowledge we had and now it was like a refresher uh, course for us very informative lecture sir thank you ma thank you very much i'm glad that you patiently heard it uh, sir namaste <laughs> namaste uh, so first of all i would like to say uh, for taking such a good uh, topic uh, sir i wanted to ask one thing uh, is there any reference for uh, uh, like the formation of the universe in the vedas yes there are several uh, there are several mantras in the srishti sukta uh-huh. you can please go through that 
and also all of them are translated in the uh, sakshi publications srishti sukta and we have made a separate book also ha ah, sir creation mantras are there okay sir okay sir thank you thank you very much you are doing really uh, great job thank you sir i have a question please uh, uh, today's uh, lecture was too good very informative and uh, i feel it has to reach many more people because we are not aware of uh, our vedas our culture so maybe we should uh, reach to larger audience i have a question here you said um, vedas are very informative and rishis have mastered it but in spite of that why do the rishis have uh, so much of anger and also curse why do they uh, they get so angry, right yeah so yeah. what is that the because they have achieved everything they have conquered everything but they have not conquered their anger can you please give me the example of one or two such rishis whom you have come across maybe pratishta also or uh, even um, durvasa they used to get angry right they have mastered everything they have attained the highest uh, you know knowledge yes 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 here so, you, you, you named two rishis Yeah. One is Durvasa. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So Durvasa is not a Vedic Rishi. Okay. Vasistha is definitely the Rishi. In the Puranas, in Puranas, there yeah. are several such things. But yeah. But uh, I clearly do not know the Vasistha of Veda is the same Vasistha of uh, Purana, and okay. I feel they are two different. Okay. Rishis never quarrel themselves. the gods never quarrel among themselves and yeah. there is no question of carrying the anger anger is the first weakness of any sadhaka exactly exactly only yeah one you when you only once you shun the anger then yeah. only the first small step of sadhana starts yeah according to my information rishis were most tolerant people otherwise mm -hmm. they would not have done such a tapas and reached to the peak of the tapas and heard the mantras so let us not confuse with the rishis in the puranas okay so the, okay so there's a difference between yeah yes ma'am yes yes and even okay. the gods in the purana they quarrel um, each other you have heard so many stories yeah, indra yeah, quarreling yeah, yeah, with yeah, so many right. people yeah. and indra always claiming for the ramba urvashi and this exactly all these things are there in purana so such mm. stories are not there in uh, Eda Urvashi means the one, the mm -hmm. one who gives the delight by the joy of the work, not by the physical appearance. So we brought all these gods, goddesses to the human level, and mm -hmm. we saw ourselves in them. So this wide gap is created, and confusion is created. Let us okay. not, uh, uh, let us not uh, confuse with the gods of the Veda and the rishis of the Veda and the. rishis and gods of the puranas gods. yes okay so there's a lot um, basically difference lot of difference <laughs> yes okay yes. okay yeah thank you so much namaste uh, my question is uh, a beginner like me who want to know veda uh, can you give some uh, suggestion to me in the light of sri arvindo's literature can i a specific suggestion for any book to who to which i can start my journey to learn veda i suggest you to start with the hymns to the mystic fire because shri arbindo has clearly said that the first nine mantras of the first man mandala that is 1.1 first mandala and the first sukta that is the summary of the whole rigveda if somebody understand clearly the symbolism or the in or the secret meaning of the first nine mantras as good as they have caught hold of the core of the veda so i request and suggest you to start studying the uh, in fact he has written extensive notes on these nine mantras start with them and after that you can take the the secret of the veda or you can take parallelly it is nice to listen from sir and kedar ji for your questions and uh, sir has clearly mentioned about the text which you may please refer 
I just want to add something that if you refer to Sri Aurobindo's other writings also, essays, philology, uh, there is another chapter book, and all the writings of Sri Aurobindo, the complete works of Sri Aurobindo is available on the website of Sri Aurobindo Ashram Trust. You can refer to uh, the website and get the PDF copies to that. And uh, I hope that uh, to understand the Vedas in the light of Sri Aurobindo, three of his writings, as Sir mentioned, The Secret of the Vedas, Hymns to the Mystic Fire, and Essays on Philology and the Vedas, I think these are quite uh, good books. And it will really, I just want to share my experience. I studied, uh, completed my uh, Doctor of Philosophy from Utkal University with specialization in the Vedic studies. And when I was uh, doing my doctoral degree, I came here in Pondicherry 2008. I stayed here for one and a half year to study the Vedas in the light of Sri Aurobindo. And when I came to know about his ideas, this is really quite uh, you know, extraordinary things when he sees the history and the symbolic things. So this is my just a little submission into this. Namaste Ji. I don't think you mentioned anything about uh, the Upanishads. Is it significant? or not in, um, in Sri Aurobindo's um, writings, or I don't recall maybe reading about that, but maybe you would know more than I do. Thank you. Yes. So we restricted our today's talk to the secret of the Veda. So the Veda books are divided into four, you know it. That is Veda Samhitas, then the Brahmanas, Aranyakas, and the Upanishads, or you call it as Vedanta. Some other time, when uh, an opportunity comes to talk about the Upanishads, we can definitely deal with the message of the Upanishads. Upanishads are the continuation of the Vedas, and uh, let us not be confused with the statement of the West, some of the Western scholars that uh, uh, the rishis of the Upanishads revolted against the Veda. This that we let us not be confused. They are continuation of the Veda, but uh, as uh, Sri Aurobindo found that uh, Veda, once you understand the symbolism of the Veda, it 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 gives you a straight path. It shows you the straight path to divinity. And as far as uh, understanding the Upanishad you also require to apply the logical mind because that is the way rishis take you from one stage of journey to another stage so both are important and uh, as the time permits we can think about that so we can study both of them that make that makes our journey still better thank you uh, thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation and sharing your valuable time with the with a lot of scholars I hear. And as I mentioned in the beginning that uh, Auro Bharati's main vision to create a love and passion for Mother India and to create to and to take the knowledge to the entire world. Which Sri Aurobindo says that the Vedic message Yatra Vishwa Bhavati Ekonidam, where the entire universe is a family. So our main concern is to give a special emphasis on the scriptures and to organize such kind of programs and the research things. And as we have received some of the suggestions and in the beginning I mentioned, we started this lecture with sirs, uh, Dr. Raghunath Jahagidhar Bhaiyat's inaugural speech and it will go on. We'll specific focus on uh, several topics on the Vedas. And I request all of you to kindly send us the emails or any suggestions we can incorporate and how we can proceed further in this. We are also trying to create a strong network with the Vaidhik Gurukulas and the research centers. So in a collaborative way, we can proceed further and do the things in the service of Shorbindo and the mother. And on behalf of Aurobh Bharti and Sri Aurobindo Society, I'd like to pay our sincere thanks to our today's speaker, Dr. Raghunath Bhaiya, and uh, our sincere thanks to all the uh, audience, those who joined for this initiative. And I hope this is just a beginning and we will take it forward with the support of all of you. And we are really blessed to listen uh, uh, today from you here. And this is really indeed a matter of great pleasure for us. So 
as the Veda says, Ano Bhadraha Katavayantu Vishwataha. Let noble thoughts come to us from every side. With these few words, once again, thank you so much. And we will meet again in different occasions and different times. Namaste to all of you. We will conclude it with Shanti Mantra. Yeah, please. Om Vasato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amrutang Gamaya Om Shanti Shanti Shanti